All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nelly, for, for your wonderful words. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, two, uh, two women um, who, who work behind the scene. Uh, of course, uh, Oshie, uh, you did uh, a lot of work uh, to make this event possible. So thanks for all your logistical work. I want to also take this opportunity to thank Reina, who is, who is somewhere in the system, uh, who has done all the registration work and setting up Zoom and everything for us. So thank you for your work. Um, so I'm going to begin the Japanese uh, session uh, uh, so that it's going to be myself and Taiko uh, presenting two uh, separate and yet interrelated presentations. Uh, Taiko is going to focus upon the political side of the thing called Edge Port, Nippon. We call it Edge Port. And I'm going to talk about ethical implications of Edge Port for broader discussions around international uh, development and cooperation. And our work are, are extensively drawing upon the report that we uh, compiled and put together and submitted to the Ministry of Education in, in March 2021. And I'm going to share the link to the uh, report because the, uh, I found that the, it's a bit uh, very difficult to get to this link. And somehow, Ministry of Education put this link in a very obscure location in the website. It's almost nearly impossible to get to. So I'm going to share the link with you guys so that, oh, unfortunately, the report is written in Japanese and it's quite uh, uh, voluminous. It's about 280 pages long. But uh, I guess I'm sharing this link with the Japanese readers just in case they might be interested in the work uh, upon which we are making a presentation today. So I'm going to make, uh, share the link. Uh, over to you, Taiko. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your uh, kind introduction, everyone. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great to meet you. Uh, so my name is Taiko Kitsu. I'm a professor at the Otsuma Women's University in Tokyo. Um, and before I begin my talk, uh, let me thank Oshie-san and Reina-san, our colleagues at Tampere University, and uh, University of Kyoto for organizing this really exciting event and uh, inviting me to talk. So let me share my slides. Okay, so um, my presentation today, which is the first half of the uh, our joint presentation with Keita, I'll talk about some uh, basic features of Port Japan and its official objectives and key functions, as well as some important contexts in which this policy emerged. And by so doing, I will try to illuminate how multiple and seemingly uh, contradictory rationales are simultaneously pursued in Edgeport, and which were shaped by the complex interplay of global and local forces. Um, so what's Edgeport Japan? Um, Edgeport Japan was launched by the Ministry of Education, uh, Culture, Science, and Technology, which is so-called MEXT um, in Japan in 2016. It's touted as a public-private partnerships to proactively introduce and transfer Japanese style of education overseas, most specifically to the emerging economies in so-called developing countries. It's also touted as a multi-ministerial platform of which not only MEX, but other ministries and government agencies are the members, namely Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, which is in charge of the uh, Japan's official development assistance and uh, Japan External Trade Organization, JETRO. So what does Edgeport uh, Japan try to achieve through this you know, so-called All Japan Initiative? Um, these are uh, three official objectives of the Edgeport. On some wordings, have been changed recently, and some word has actually been completely eliminated. But the ones that I'm uh, showing right now is the original, uh, the original ones that are unveiled in uh, 2017. Firstly, it aims at internationalizing Japanese education through internationalizing Japanese curriculum and Japanese people through transnational interactions. It also aims at increasing the number of foreign students coming to study in Japanese universities. Um, so we can say that um, this is kind of educational and learning rationale. And secondly, um, it aims at increasing pro-Japanese populations overseas, raising uh, Japan's soft power and international standing, while at the same time addressing global issues 
uh, such as helping to achieve SDGs and ESD. And thirdly, it aims at contributing to uh, Japanese economic uh, growth by firstly, um, by uh, expanding Japanese edge of businesses operations in overseas market. And secondly, by developing a uh, Japanese style human capital needed for Japanese style infrastructure system, such as roads, ports, bridges to be exported from Japan to the emerging Asian countries. Um, I will come back to this point um, later. But overall, so Edgeport tries to achieve these sort of multiple objectives, which are supported by differing rationale and um, so have some inherent tensions and contradiction because they represent the interests of the different ministries and different stakeholders. And for instance, um, there's a tension between the conflictive rhetoric of marketization of national education and learning from others through cross-border, uh, cross-national interaction. And also marketizing one's, uh, one's national education model might clash with the humanist intent to contribute to the interest of the others. Because marketization is essentially about making profits by shaping the interests and preferences of the others. Um, so the claim that marketization of one's education doesn't clash with the interests of the other nation is premised upon the belief that one's national education model is superior to that of the other nations. And in this paradigm, I think uh, Japan's proactive act of sharing, proactively sharing it and even setting it, um, you know, setting the education model overseas is justified because it's, a, you know, it's a seen as a benevolent act of the Japanese government and the private sector together. So um, how does Edgeport try to achieve these multiple objectives? There are two main functions of Edgeport. One is public relations about uh, Japanese education through developing uh, promotional videos and brochures, uh, organizing education fairs and holding dissemination seminars and so on. And the other function is uh, pilot projects. Uh, whoever wish to transfer their education practices overseas can apply for this scheme. And between 2017 to 2020, uh, 66 projects have been selected as pilot projects. And there are a wide range of pilot project beneficiaries. And interestingly, they're not only edge business, but they are, um, include uh, public and private universities and non-governmental organizations and municipal education board and so on and so forth. So that means transnational interaction under edge port is not just education exports by private business, but also it includes the various other forms of transnational educational interactions, including university cross-border collaboration, international aid and cooperation by, um, by various actors, and a very small-scale grassroots education interaction, and sometimes a mixture of all these. Um, the kind of education practices that pilot projects try to achieve also vary greatly, uh, ranging from lesson study, health education, um, school sports festival, robotics education, um, and to name but a few. And the project activities are predominantly uh, conducted in the emerging economies of Southeast Asia and with overwhelming numbers uh, centered in Vietnam. But also uh, you can find a project in other regions and countries as well. Um, I think there are some issues uh, related to um, concerning this pilot project scheme. Each pilot project implementer is basically free to describe their practices and products as Japanese style of education, although there's no public consensus on what the Japanese style of education really is. Um, so despite such discursiveness and ambiguity, um, and whether it's widely practiced in Japan or not, once they're selected, they'll become officially certified Edgeport supported Japanese side of education and receive various financial and non-financial support from the states. Um, but the grant amount for uh, each project is very small, negligent, and only half of the project actually gets grant. But there are a range of non-financial support from the state, uh, including the support by the Japanese embassy and JICA office in the country that they operate, um, in facilitating making an appointment with the, with the high-level government officials uh, of their counterpart countries, uh, among others. So this um, official support and endorsement from the Japanese government seems to have a 
significant for the private edge businesses and private universities because it will give them much needed credibility and legitimacy for them to you know work uh, in uh, uh, you know overseas uh, context and uh, um, there are some uh, interesting uh, example um, for instance one Japanese music uh, instrument company and one sports equipment company uh, they have been trying hard to get their programs adopted in the national curriculum of Vietnam but they have not been so successful when they're just doing it by themselves. Uh, it was just simply impossible to break the bureaucratic red tape in Vietnam. But once they are selected as an uh, Egyport um, pro pilot project and then endorsed by the Japanese government and received some support from the Japanese embassy, then these companies successfully managed to get their programs adopted in Vietnamese national curriculum. Um, and we could say that um, this is quite a historic turn in Japan because um, Japan and the Ministry of Education in particular has been taking very cautious attitudes towards education interventions in the matters of education of other nations for many years, uh, mainly because of uh, its pre-war history uh, of uh, occupation of neighboring countries in Asia. So how did this unprecedented policy uh, got shaped and budgeted? in Japan at uh, the particular time? It's a really uh, interesting question. Um, there are a number of global and local forces that seem to have influenced the policy and policy formation processes of Egyport. Um, but uh, certainly, um, um, there has been a growing foreign interest in Japanese education in recent years, including uh, Japanese types of uh, colleges of technology, uh, so uh, called uh, uh, Kosen and Tokkatsu, which is a multiple non-subject uh, student special activities in school, such as cleaning and lunch duties by students themselves aiming at developing a whole child. And one such attention came from the Egyptian president, El, El Sisi, who expressed his willingness to introduce Japanese Tokkatsu in the schools in Egypt, uh, with the expectation that it will contribute to peace, stability, and the prosperity of his nation. And uh, uh, one should know that Egypt at the time was just after the Arab Spring. So it's a good example of how countries try to borrow education from other countries to push their own existing domestic reform agenda. So similar to Finland, Japanese Egyport uh, tried capitalizing on this growing international attraction to education model. But there seems to be some differences as well. Uh, whereas overseas attraction to Finnish education come mostly from its remarkable performance in Asia, okay, uh, which made Finland as one of the most well-known uh, reference society, I understand. But in the case of Japan, overseas attraction to Japanese education doesn't necessarily come from its performance on PISA alone, but also comes seems to come from its unique economic and social development trajectories uh, exemplified by post-war industrialization and rapid economic growth as a non-West nation, and perhaps also like unique social order that we have. However, interestingly, uh, it's the Japanese side which often uses um, the Japan's PISA performance to either indicate the relative superiority of the Japanese education or use it to implicitly legitimize its proactive move to transfer. And in addition, uh, the Japanese education practices, which are often seen unique and distinctive from outside, are often recontextualized and decontextualized by the Japanese actors by using the universalist language of the um, international large scale assessment in education, such as PISA. Um, Probably, presumably with an uh, sort of expectation that it would enhance their transferability and universality. And then also probably um, is an expectation that it's easier that way, you know, to explain what Japanese education is all about to the other non-Japanese. Okay. Um, but um, this external attraction to Japanese education alone, however, can sufficiently explain uh, why Japan you know, decided to take this proactive move to turn into um, sort of education, proactive education transfer. So we need to understand specific national economic and geopolitical context. 
Firstly, um, the Japanese economy has been going through a long-term economic stagnation after the collapse of the so-called bubble economy in the early 90s. And uh, relatedly, um, uh, we have been experiencing a dramatic demographic changes. Uh, birth rate has been declining at an, uh, an uh, alarming uh, rate, and uh, um, uh, which led to the shrinking of the domestic market, of course. And um, so many industries in Japan, including edge businesses, uh, started looking for market opportunities outside of Japan, but they have uh, faced intense competitions in a global market. At the same time, many manufacturing industry of Japan, such as automobile and electronics industry, which once sort of contribute to the you know, Japanese um, sort of a miracle, economic, a miraculous economic growth, have relocated to uh, their production points to other countries in Asia. Uh, while we, um, um, so that sort of necessitates the sort of Japanese types of human capital in foreign countries. And secondly, uh, there was a change in the geopolitical landscape as well. Uh, there's a rise of China, which has become major economic and military power in Asia. And at the same time, many Asian countries have also made a steady economic growth, uh, becoming both market opportunities and market competitors for Japan. So against these backdrops, uh, revitalizing Japanese economy and international standing become a, a key policy agenda of Japan. And in uh, 2012, uh, four years before Edge Port got started, uh, Shinzo Abe, a well-known nationalist, and, uh, returned to power for the second time. And then as soon as he returned to power, he started pursuing this, his proactive economic diplomacy uh, to restore Japanese economic and political power. And one of his uh, flagship initiatives was um, uh, infrastructure export policy which tried to sell Japanese infrastructure system, such as highways and airports, to emerging uh, Asian economies through uh, PPPs. Uh, and then it was argued that construction and operations of Japanese study infrastructure, infrastructure needs not only the export of the physical equipment, but also uniquely Japanese type of human resources with uh, you know, unique soft skills and set of work values, uh, such as like uh, strict time management, and cooperative attitude and so on. And so Abe instructed the relevant ministries to support this policy. And interestingly, um, so this infrastructure export policy, which is you know, seemingly totally unrelated to education, actually became one of the important policy drivers for the age group. And in addition, um, promoting edu businesses overseas also became an important agenda for uh, Japanese government. I've said earlier, Japanese edge businesses have been actively seeking new education market overseas, and uh, um, but uh, they have um, faced a fierce competition, especially uh, with the Western English medium edge businesses. And uh, next official, uh, Minister of Education official, didn't immediately feel that it's their job to promote overseas operation of edge business because their main job is to really to you know administer. The local education affairs, uh, but this, you know, policy environment in Japan, uh, with the you know strong power centered in the prime minister's office, and also some demands directly expressed by the edge businesses themselves, seems to have changed the, uh, you know, their initial non-committal attitude. So in a way, edge businesses was part of the policy formation process. And, uh, and meanwhile, uh, it's interesting that the, you know, the MEX has closely studied about the national education export strategy of Finland and Singapore. They even sent a delegation to Finland to study its national education uh, export strategy. So we could say that there, are, there was some kind of transnational borrowing of the national education export stra strategy as well. And uh, um, so this is, uh, I'm, almost coming to the end. Um, and uh, okay, so um, in addition to this economic rationale, there was also strong motivation to use Edgeport as an important tool for international aid. 
And uh, indeed, the transfer of Japanese study of education um, with the strong involvement of private, sec private sector was considered as, a, as an important Japanese international cooperation with education. And coincidentally, JICA has also actively involved in education businesses in their operations. And uh, uh, this is, you know, the, some of the background, important background is the declining of ODA budget. And uh, so using aid to serve national interest has become, uh, you know, uh, agenda. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, at the same time, there has been a call for branding Japanese aid, building upon Japanese unique comparative advantage. And finally, one other motive uh, to initiate edge port uh, seems to come from the, um, the need, perceived need to internationalize Japanese education, and not only to make uh, Japanese education uh, globally competitive, but also nurture um, sort of Japanese uh, people, you know, so, sort of like, uh, the, like the Japanese people with the attitude uh, uh, of the, you know, global mind and sort of transnational understanding and so forth. Okay, so this is my final slide. And last but not, uh, not least, I want to mention the important mediating role that was played by the special advisor of the minister, uh, special advisor to the minister of the Minister of Education at the time. Uh, being a former METI, a Minister of uh, Economy and Trade bureaucrat, who turned into politician, having close links with the private edu businesses and education department of OECD, he successfully aligned the divergent in conflict in domestic interest to shape the edu port. At the same time, he strategically mobilized the international policy discourses, not only to legitimize uh, the policy, but also smooth over tensions and contradiction inherent in edge port. So again, um, you know, these cases suggest that global and national forces cannot be hierarchically positioned, but you know, they are rather closely entangled and we can't separate them neatly. So that's the end of my presentation and then over to Keita. Thank you very much. Oh, I thank you, Taiko. Now, uh, having heard uh, Taiko's presentation, it's a bit difficult to talk about ethics, isn't it? Because uh, it sounds to me that the age report is completely saturated with the political, geopolitical uh, interest of the big players. So it's kind of difficult to talk about where the hell is, is actually ethics in, in this scheme, right? So I'm going to try my best to really try and excavate excavate is a term that i want to use quite consciously here excavate the good sense in edge port i'm not making an argument to defend edge port that's not what i'm trying to do here but i'm trying to see some element of good sense in edge port so that we can actually release it and amplify it for better causes right so that's what i'm going to do so excavating good sense in the Asia port towards ethics in international educational development. So ethics, uh, in order to make my argument, I want to uh, draw upon this Japanese uh, scholar, uh, Noriyuki uh, Hashimoto, who is an interesting young scholar who does a lot of philosophical work around, around ethics in international educational development. So I'm going to draw upon his work and I'll put him in conversation with other scholars to articulate my notion, heavily drawing upon his work, of course, but you know, particular notion of ethics that I wanna uh, operationalize in the rest of the conversation. So uh, Hashimoto argues, when a question is raised about the ethicality of international cooperation in education, it creates a self-doubt and hesitation. These are the two terms I want to highlight here, self-doubt and hesitation in the action of those involved. On the contrary, if international cooperation in education is pursued without any hesitation, their act will become unreflective and unethical. Ethics in international cooperation in education necessarily requires us to doubt and hesitation. That's my emphasis. Before we even think about what we can do for others. Ejipo Nippon 
shows no sign of self-doubt, no hesitation. What is visible is promotion only. Now, remember that Taiko was talking about proactive promotion of Japanese style of teaching pedagogy overseas, right? So Hashimoto ends up providing a rather um, scathing critique of Egyptport. It's almost dismissive of what Egyptport tried to do. I'm going to disagree with him in terms of, in terms of his assessment of Egyptport, but I do embrace his philosophical take on ethics. So just to spend more time on what Hashimoto is arguing about ethics. He argues that education and development, these two acts necessarily involves normative and value-laden judgment around the question of what is good and what is desirable. You can't escape. It's because the condition for education, the basic condition for education development is the asymmetrical relationship. Education and development does not even exist without the presence of asymmetrical relationship. So teachers are empowered to decide upon what students learn or how they should learn. In a similar fashion, aid givers by and large in a powerful position to decide how poor countries or developing countries should develop. So it is based upon the asymmetrical relationship. And the danger of that relationship is that it often leads to unilateral imposition of values. What I think is good for you is good for you. There's no questions, hesitations around that. So you end up falsely universalizing your sense of self through others. And that is precisely what cultural imperialism was about, according to Hashimoto. So to practice ethics in education and international development, we need to be highly reflexive and being able to doubt ourselves and exercise reservation and hesitation. So ethics, in a, uh, I'm going to continue with Hashimoto's argument. So conditions for ethics in educational development, two conditions are we should be able to destabilize our sense of self as opposed to unlimited expansion of self or false universalization of self. And we need to be able to recognize negativity in us, in ourself, through others. And then we're going to put Hashimoto in conversation with uh, Fuyuki Kurosawa, who has published this book called Ethnological Imagination, Cross-Cultural Critique of Modernity. He's an sociologist. But it's, it's an interesting book. He talks about all sorts of different uh, um, classical sociologists or uh, social uh, thinkers like Durkheim, Mark, uh, Marx, uh, Weber, uh, Durkheim, and so forth. Uh, a few other people I can't remember. But what he essentially argues in, in the book is central to the uh, uh, rise of uh, uh, critical thought, social theory, is this intellectual practice of cross-cultural mode of self-critique. That is, those thinkers were uh, engaged in cross-cultural analysis of Western modernity by referring to uh, cultural conditions of other places in the world. So they were constantly mobilizing mythical notion of others in order to be able to raise questions about the Western modernity and try to distance themselves from the norms and conventions of Western modernity. So ethnological imagination allows for the temporal and spatial estrangement that is making things strange of self through encounters with others. It allows for detachment of yourself from the here and now. So essentially, ethnological imagination is about self-unlearning. And I think the discussion around ethics developed by Hashimoto relates very much with this notion of ethnological imagination and self-unlearning and detachment and so forth. So I'm going to draw upon these concepts in order to assess to what extent 
those who are actually involved in Ejiput actually enacted ethics in the way they talk about Ejiput. And what I'm trying to do is despite all the glimp, depressing, almost depressing picture of Ejiput, and I agree that Ejiput is largely dominated by economic political interests, but I'm trying to excavate, I'm trying to dig deep in order to find some good sense in the thing called Ejiput, right? So first interview, mixed official, ministry official within uh, the international division. So that's the division in charge of the operation of uh, Ejiput. So he is talking about Mr. K, who was the high ranked official at the time, at the time of the just, just uh, um, um, at the time of the uh, implementation of Ejiput, who was actually quite instrumental in making Ejiput possible. So in reference to this guy, this official says the following, I believe that the Mr. K was hoping that Ejiput would offer a view of a Japanese education as seen from abroad. That is to make visible those practices that had, that had been taken for granted in Japan, including the so-called the strength of Japanese education, which was accepted without evidence. So notice that he is actually envisioning it's important as a form of self and learning. Learning and unlearning is a tool to rethink the Japanese education with. He was also of the view that Japanese education was stuck in the status quo, in that we were not trying anything new and different. So interesting how they see education as a source of new ideas to rethink their own practices and systems. Number two, another mixed international division of his uh, stuff. I think it might have to do with a sense of remorse about cultural imperialism of Japan's past. So he was telling me about why ministry is so, uh, in a sense, very reserved, not aggressive enough about promoting Japanese education overseas, right? So he was trying to explain why. Mex tends to refrain from any attempt to promote strength of Japanese education overseas, let alone anything to do with influencing foreign countries' education through cultural means, though I'm not too sure about politicians. So politicians are quite proactive, but ministry officials are always, ah, we don't want to go there, we don't want to do that, right? What I have always stressed to, again, another uh, official within the international division, what I have always stressed to the Asia board grantees, oh, by the way, this guy was actually in, in the office, uh, directly in charge of Asia board when I interviewed him. What I have always stressed to the Asia board pilot project grantees is, is something like education is so deeply entangled with the tradition and the culture of the country. So please don't think that copy and paste of Japanese education will work. This is absolutely crucial. So that's what he was telling to all the grantees of Asia board money. I know there were some grantees who simply thought of transplanting Japanese practice as is into other places. But perhaps that is not really what Asia board should be about. It is about grasping the essence of Japanese education, which can be applicable to other countries. It is a mistake to think that Asia board is about how wonderful and great Japanese education is, unless it helps us understand what it is that makes Japanese education work. The goals of age board aren't really achieved. Again, the emphasis is on self-learning and unlearning. Interview four. So this one is the interview with this, one of the steering committee members who was very instrumental, again, in making age board possible. But education is a bit different from trains and bullet trains. It is very sensitive, not something to be imposed upon others. And MEX officials do not even think about making money by exporting Japanese education. Whether it is good or bad, they have no idea, not even a taste for business. So they have the clueless about making money. Of course, that's not what they're in. And besides, they find a project like Edupo troublesome. It costs them too much money, and with little return for them. 
They're not interested in the infrastructure export, while the Prime Minister's Cabinet Office, Ministry of Economy, Trade, Industry are, as Taiko's presentation clearly demonstrated earlier. As I worked at the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, I have the business sense. So I think I can appreciate the both. So he was actually the middle, middle guy. He's, he was actually the one who bridged the gap between ministry and other powerful ministries in order to make a report possible. But it's quite interesting to see how he talks about ministry, right? So ministry has completely a different set of agenda than other powerful actors. Last question again, another steering committee member. If I say, because Japanese education is superior, you should do as told, then it is the attitude of cultural imperialism, isn't it? And this is not what Egypt is about. When Japanese education gets tried elsewhere, it acts like a mirror where we get to observe what is great and otherwise about Japanese education. So seeing others trying Japanese education allows us to rethink what Japanese education is. And I believe this is the aspect of Egypt that is most important for MEXT. And it is precisely why I decided to get involved. You notice the strong emphasis on self and learning in these comments. And if you look at the promotional videos and exhibition that they have put up in an international World Education Expos and so forth. So I have only five minutes, all right? I'm gonna speak twice faster than I have been, which is impossible. Now, it's interesting, I've, we've spoken to the people who are actually involved in the production of these videos, promotional videos, right? What they emphasize, also the, the direction that they were getting from ministry was that make sure that the, any representation that we're gonna put in these videos has to be average. It has to be about facts. It's not about selling. And if you watch these videos, if you click on this link here, you can watch the video and it's, it's provided in multiple languages. It's fascinating, especially if you compare this video with the Finnish, Finnish flashy, um, highly commercialized video that you guys got. It's such a contrast, but it's about facts. And it's all so ordinary. The title of the video says everything. One day of elementary school students in Japan. Japanese style of education from the viewpoint of teachers. And if we watch this video, any Japanese person will say, ah, well, yeah, that's what we see in any schools that we walk into across this country. There's no spin, no gimmick, and minimum sound and visual effects. And I don't see any branding effort in these videos, unfortunately, unfortunately. And where the hell is a proactive promotion here? So where does this all come from? So this is where my speculation comes in. Tradition there is a tradition that needs to be recognized. And I don't think ministry officials understand this tradition quite well. Japan's international development assistance, there's a history. Um, uh, Kenneth King and uh, um, Kuroda both argue there's something distinctive about Japanese approach to international development assistance. There's a strong focus on self-help. There's a strong respect for recipient countries' ownership and what they call intrinsic characteristics of the country. We're gonna respect that. And this term that King uses, we will wait until ownership is in place. So it's a very time consuming process. And King thinks that that's absolutely admirable. And Kuroda emphasizes that there is an attitude of humility in Japanese approach to international development. Where does this actually come from? It's interesting, again, speculation. But Sawamura argues, if you, take, if you trace the history of international development in Japan, it began as part of the post-war reparation for war loss and damages to the neighboring Asian countries. So it's basically sorry money. We did something bad for you. Please accept this money. Now you can't possibly be arrogant when you're making that sort of offer. And Saito argues that it is a reflection. It's, it's because of the Japanese people's reflection on 
GHQ, uh, General Headquarters intervention, quite aggressive intervention into Japanese education during the post-war reconstruction period. So basically saying, well, we don't want to do what American did to us, speculation. But it's interesting, in one way or another, this particular approach to development is a reflection of the Japanese particular history of Japanese uh, education in the post-war period. So now I've talked about the ministry officials and how the notion of ethic was enacted and articulated by ministry officials. So I'm going to bring the discussion down to the people who are on the ground, who actually received the uh, Edgeport money or certification in order to implement their version of Japanese style of education in different parts of the world and how the notion of ethics was enacted by or not enacted by these ground level actors. First one, uh, pilot project grantee A, private corporation, profit making uh, company tried to implement Japanese education for food or education around food, so-called shokuiku, right? most clearly uh, exemplified by uh, Japanese lunch duties, right? So he was, he was there in a country in Southeast Asia to promote this particular pedagogical practices and make money, of course. And his reflection was interesting. I have come to realize that Japanese education is the culmination of all the efforts made by generations before us, beginning from the post-war era of material shortages to today. Home economics, uh, school lunch, and national course of study are all nicely integrated around the concept of education for and through food, shokuiku. And I was just struck how remarkable it is to have such a well-developed system. And he goes on to say, I have come to realize that Japanese teachers have the teaching skill sets that are truly, remarkably, the world standard. So if you reflect back upon the notion of ethics that's articulated by Hashimoto, you can see how the notion of self is completely bloated. It's a false universalization of self. We know what's best for you. So you take what we offer you as is. Unreserved drive to promote Japanese education globally. So despite all the reservations and doubts and self doubts, expressed by the ministry officials. When the project get down to the ground level, that view, that ethical norms are not quite shared here. Second example, pilot project B, university professor. His mission was to implement and promote Japanese physical education in a country, a country U in Africa. It was interesting. He said that, well, in, in this country, there's less regulation, a lot more freedom. Kids are just wild. And there's a lot more freedom and respect for individuality. And he said African bodies are underdeveloped, needs to be developed. And he has this unquestioned belief in the superiority of Japanese physical education, right? So you think that, well, oh, this is another example of the false universalization of self. But as we were talking to each other, then I had to push a few questions just to encourage him to reflect a bit more about his own experience. And it was interesting because he shifted in the course of the conversation. He expressed his awareness about Japanese physical education's key features, that is strong body regulations, regimentation, and a collective focus. And then after that, he said, oh, maybe we're doing it too much. Perhaps physical education could be different. And I asked him, how could it be different, do you think? And he started talking about how African teachers were using music in physical education, which is completely unthinkable in a Japanese physical education. And he was amazed how, kids, how much fun kids are having in moving their bodies with music. So it was interesting because there was an emerging negativity of self in the way he talked about Japanese physical education. Is Japanese physical education excessively controlling? He started wondering, where is fun? 
where is the recognition of individual difference in what we do? So although he still believed in the superiority of the Japanese physical education, in the course of the conversation, he started questioning. So self in minor doubt. The last one, destabilized sense of self. Pilot Project Grant TC, a nonprofit organization, they were trying to transfer a Japanese community center or Kominkan to a country E in Africa. In the course of the project, there was a clear shift in focus. Initially, they were trying to transfer this Japanese best practice to Africa. And then they realized that they're actually trying to reclaim what country E used to have. So all the elders in the country started saying to him that, well, we have something similar in our country long, long time ago, right? So they discussed, well, we don't necessarily have to borrow what Japan come up with. We have something already. We just have to revitalize what we had before, time's up. And in the course of the conversation, this guy was very clear about the negativity of Japanese community center. There's all sorts of problems with it. Lack of substance, it's out of touch, and it's continued to st be stuck in status quo and so forth. And here's what he said in our conversation, describing a response from a country E, a counterpart to whom this guy had just explained about the declining quality of some of Japanese community center. He said, it is not just a problem for Japan. So this, the counterpart, he said, said to him, Egyptian, guy, oh, I shouldn't have said Egyptian, but country E in Africa, that's Egypt is the only country that started with E, so it's Egypt. It is not just a problem for Japan. We are looking up to Japan. We want Japan to be an exemplary for other countries. When he told me about all this, I felt like I had my heart shot through. We cannot possibly be stuck, slacking off. We cannot possibly be slacking off, sorry. Uh, when other countries are looking up to Japanese community center, they say, unless you keep up good work, there won't be any that we can use as a model. When I heard him say that, I felt like he had given me some homework to do. I said to myself that Japan, Japan must have a hard look at JCC and remodel it in a way that is suitable for the contemporary time. We must let it grow so it can be useful resource for other countries. So what happened in the end in, the, in this project was really a collaboration between Japan and Egypt in order to really revitalize the, what seems to be, what can be called the community center in respective countries. So Japan stopped being the model for Egypt and it was a completely uh, much more horizontal, mutual uh, learning taking place. All right, conclusion. Oh, good, last slide. So what was I trying to do in this presentation? Is there a Japanese model in international educational development? Is there any evidence of that in Egypt? There's a potential in Egypt, I think. A potential in the sense that Egypt could present as uh, international educational development that includes the educational export as a self estrangement or self transformative project, self unlearning project. But of course, there's a considerable limit as well as Taiko's presentation clearly demonstrated. How consistently was the ethics promoted by a factor in the design of Egypt? In our report, we raise a serious question, to what extent all this rhetoric around doubt, reservations, anti-cultural cult, uh, anti imperialism and so forth, so all this rhetoric, to what extent those languages actually reflected in the very design of Egypt? We had to raise some question, hard question. We also have to ask, would strange bedfellow work? The fact that the Ministry of Education, that's much more ethically minded in my view, working closely with other powerful ministries and political economic interests. Would that going to really work? Ethics in this presentation, the particular articulation of ethics that I presented here is a reflective of Japan's particular historical experience. And I think it's an interesting way and a quite generative and productive way of presenting ethics in international development and cooperation. 
Lastly, I want to talk about the role of researchers. It's easy to critique, going back to the first slide of the presentation, Hashimoto's uh, critique, sweeping critique of Asia Port. In his view, there was, there's no ethics in Asia Port. It's simply about exportation. But if you start talking to people who are actually directly involved in Asia Port, you come to realize, no, there's all sorts of different voices and views within the ministry. And there are still good sense shared amongst the ministry officials, and that needs to be recognized. So as a, as a, job, as, as a job as a researcher for me, at least, is to excavate and identify, no, no matter how fleeting that might be, no matter how insignificant and small that might be, and try to excavate the good sense and try to amplify and release the potential. So that's essentially what we try to do in our report. Thanks very much. Sorry for going over time.